Okay, so dead people. Um, as I'm going to be talking on death and burial rights. I don't know if you guys know, like, from the flyer um, that was sent out. That's I don't know why I picked that topic. Um, quit eating. You're eating me hungry. Um, you keep eating, man. Halfway through this thing, you're going to be it's going to be coming out again. It's, it's a pretty nasty. Yeah, this is not PG-13. Um, but anyway, yeah. So the reason I was just, I mean, I thought this was a really cool topic. I was doing a lot of reading on uh, Jewish burial traditions. Um, I'm a Christian, and I think that that's fascinating to look at the actual like dynamics of how that happened. You know. 3 AD and whatever, you know, I was, what's, the, what's the story behind, you know, the, the death and resurrection of Lazarus and, and Jesus, and what's the, the sort of the, the landscape of how it all fits together. Um, and that's how I got interested in the topic of uh, death and burial rights, and I decided for this meeting to research, a, you know, a pantheon of, you know, what happens in, in death and burial in different cultures um, throughout antiquity, back into prehistory, and you know, forward into modern times, and does that mean anything to us? Does it, does it affect us? Um, so, I guess I'll start my slide presentation. Um, oh, I don't know how this works, so I guess just if you press forward to go forward and back to go back, it should yeah. well, figure it out. Like that much. Uh, um, and yes, that is a picture of a hand drill at the back of all my slides. I could not find an appropriate. Because what else is you going to put, right? So, um, but anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at these. I'm going to look at these three things. I'm going to go through this stuff extremely fast because, as you can appreciate, there's a lot of information involved with uh, burial and, and funeral rites. Like it is just there's heaps, and I want to cover all of it. Uh, so I'm going to spend a bit of time on the archetypical. I'm going to go into the ancient, um, which is when I say ancient, I mean uh, anything in history all the way up into the modern. So I'm going to cover basically all the different sort of religious denominational. Uh, Aspects. There are a couple of absences. There's one or two things I did not look at, just for brevity's sake, and I'll point those out. Uh, but I think it's pretty comprehensive. And the abnormal is just, um, well, I don't want to say too much about that, but it's it should be pretty interesting when we get to it. Um, and this is all sort of recent history. Um, I'll get you to go to the next slide. Uh, okay, sweet. Okay, so anyway, the place that I'm starting with is, is Jewish burial traditions. Um, now, I. I, I just want to. The reason I was interested in this is I want to to break through some of the sort of the the misconceptions or like I have pictures in my head of, of what uh, you know. I mean, because there was a lot of sort of religious contention around it of what Jewish burial looked like. Um, so I wanted to look at a bunch of the tradition, which is what I was doing. Uh, in yeah, I've got to divide it into a couple of sections. I have the procession uh, and the burial. And I'm going to go through my notes because I have a lot of information. Um, burial grounds were unfenced. So I mean, just to give you an idea of like what what they actually look like, it's I mean, remove yourself from today's modern burial grounds. Um, yet there was with tradition when somebody died in the Jewish culture, you there was um, uh, just to paint a picture of sort of the lament of losing someone in Judaism. You rend your garments, um, so there was a, sort of an anguish that you had to display. There's a mourning period which you can notice in a lot of other cultures as well that was evident in Jewish culture. Um, once the person was dead, uh, body was laid on the ground, hair, nails cut, body washed, uh, it was anointed, which is a custom of putting oil on the body for, for religious purposes um, or spiritual purposes, and then it was wrapped in the, um, the best, I guess, cloth, so the idea of shroud. You find that in Islamic practices as well, uh, that the widow could afford. Uh, now, if you were extremely poor and your wife died, um, it was tradition that you provided two flute players and one mourning woman. Um, the idea behind that is, um, we obviously don't see that in modern culture, but you have um, professional mourners, so their job is to mourn. You pay them to, to wail, you pay them to, to, I mean, I guess you can make a loose connection to, to you know, someone that does a funeral oration, but basically through the procession, they're saying, well, you know, things about the dead, um, and they're, they're paid to do that, as well as uh, flute players, so it's like musicians uh, traveling along the, along the, uh, the path. But like, as, as an example, um, some of the chanters might not have, from the research I was doing, they might yell out just bold claims about, you know, the deceased saying things like, alas the lion, alas the hero, and just, you know, willing laments. Um, the reason I have this up here, this, um, this, uh, it's a map, that's what it is. In the processions, there was, there was different, there was different traditions. Um, so you have the region of Galilee, which is right up here, and you have the region of Judea, which is down here. Uh, in Galilee, interestingly enough, in the funeral procession, you guys are gonna love this. Um, <laughs> according to the Midrash, which is like it's kind of a Talmudic writing, I understand that it's like 
uh, rabbinical that they, you, the women would go first in the funeral procession. And the reason for that was because of the, the, the biblical story of uh, Eve eating an apple, so they, she's responsible for the death, so they wanted to put her up front. But you went to, to Judea, and that's not a practice. So they'd be a normal procession. There wouldn't be the, the women up front. So there's a lot of regional you know, variations within, within this area. Um, face was originally covered um, during the procession, so basically they're carrying the body along. It's not like where you have a coffin. You have uh, a buyer. I might be mispronouncing that, but basically it's a platform that you're carrying the body on. Uh, it used to be a separation where you had the rich on wood and the poor on wicker work, but they m mandated that everyone had to be on wicker work. Just that was a rabbinical sort of mandate that said, okay, we want some sort of evenness between these, these customs uh, during death. So they, they sort of scaled that back a bit. Um, you have hands folded rest. I mean, you obviously see that in, that's a tradition we, we see today. Um, if you were unmarried, didn't have kids, um, you would often be buried with um, like a pen or a key, which is representative of your profession. So, for, I mean, I don't know what a key would represent, but if you're, say, a scribe or something, buried with a pen. Um, and if you were a bride or bridegroom, so you, you died, I guess, while you were betrothed or, I don't know, perhaps newly married, um, they'd bury you, and I'm not sure if it's uh, at your burial that you'd have a belt chain or during the procession, but basically there's a bit more funerary style involved in, you know, brides and writers. Um, and anyway, there's, yeah, heaps of cool stuff about that. Um, cemeteries, Jewish cemeteries, um, they have heaps of different names, just to give you an idea of um, what sort of the, the mindset of, of when people, when, the, you know, ancient Jews were placing people in the ground, you know, what was their sort of their connotation with the place that they were being laid. Um, they, they used to call cemeteries house of assembly, house of meeting, hostelry, uh, which that's like hostel. So uh, place of rest, place of freedom, field of weepers, house of eternity, house of life. Um, and there's two major distinctions that you'll see again throughout uh, some other funeral cult funerary cultures is that you have common graves and tombs. So a grave is when you think you put something on the ground, a tomb is where you have a tomb. Um, as far as graves go, it was only the poor people who put in graves. Um, and if you look at um, Jerusalem, for example, which is near there in Judea, um, even then, like archaeological discoveries, uh, there's you'll find that there's um, there's actually two distinctive grave sites that are for executed criminals because there was a division in some cases between you know if you were if you were executed for crime, you you could not be buried next to someone who was righteous in the, you know, the, the, the eyes of Judaism. Um, so, interesting tradition, I thought. Um, yeah, and, and um, I always remember as a kid, I couldn't walk on graves. That is a Jewish tradition. It was just considered a dishonor to do that. So, um, that comes from Judaism, Judaism, as far as I can tell. Um, and no coffins. People weren't buried in coffins. Uh, they had the, the buyer that was taken from wherever they were to the funeral site, and instead of being put in coffins in the ground, what they do is they dig the holes, and then they they line them with stone, and then in the stone you put the body, and then you cover the person up with with or dirt. Uh, in the case of grave, but that's that's sort of a um, I guess a you know, poor tradition. I mean, it's not it's the tombs was kind of the the piece de resistance. That's how you wanted to be buried. That was how people were affluent. That's how they got buried. Uh, I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, just to give you an idea of what a, a, like a, a Jewish tomb at this time was like. Um, now these things are quite elaborate, and there is some, I, I think it's quite fascinating. You basically have a division of the tombs where you have um, the burial chamber, which is you have, it's usually about six feet by six feet by nine feet. Uh, so six feet high, six feet wide, and nine feet deep. And that's for like an average tomb. And what you do is you, you, you burn it in there, you have maybe about eight bodies. Um, you, I'm pretty sure that they expanded these at some point. So um, these tombs were, were essentially, I, I have no idea who that guy is, by the way. Um, but the, these tombs were essentially, these were property, so the same way that you pass down the family home, you pass down um, this tomb. This was, this, was a, this was a valuable piece of, of real estate. Uh, the same tradition exists in Japan today, where you have funeral grave plots, um, because, I mean, in Tokyo, you, you just can't find a place to put anybody. Um, it's worth a lot of money, I mean, it's, it's, it's very important. Um, but anyway, this, this is a, a typical tomb, and I, I was at the Rolling Stones School because I think it's like, you know, the story of Jesus being buried. It's fascinating to me. Um, but the, there's, two, there's two parts of this. There's the entranceway, which is so basically when you walk into this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna find, um, it's almost like the family room, or like the living room of the tomb, 
where what happens is the funeral procession that I was talking about, when they come to the tomb, what they'll do is they'll, act, they'll enter the tomb and they'll sort of sit and mourn, wail over their dead, um, whatever tradition. A lot of them, um, you move into Roman tradition and you even get, you get much more elaborate, kind of on a different scale, but you can have kitchens inside. Um, and I think it's some Jewish terms you get as well. I'd have to quantify that though. But anyway, you have this, you have this entry area uh, where people, you know, come to. I mean, it's how they, where they sort of interact, I guess, with with the you know the the, the, the dead people in the back. <laughs> and, and then what would happen is in the in the in the back where you have basically um, what was later called in um, Roman culture they they called um, columbarium, I think, or columbarium, uh, which means dovecote, which is because if you look at the the Roman crypts, which I think I have a picture of later on, is you have um, all these um, holes, which look like you put, you put mail into them, but it was for the raising of doves, and then they took that same term, because everyone in Rome was cremated, so they then used that term for, for you know, for the, where they put the remains of the, the dead. But you have that in these, these Jewish tombs, but they're for full bodies, they're not for cremated, because that was what cremation was not custom in, in ancient Judaism, um, and, all right, kind of isn't today as well. But uh, what would happen is you then put the body in there, you leave the body in there, um, and a couple of years later, once you know the all flesh had decomposed and it was gone, and you're stuck with all these bones, I don't have a picture of this, you should be fortunate. Um, what they would do is they would then take the bones and they would anoint them again, which is the idea of putting um, oil on it for religious purposes, or spiritual, and you, you would then wrap them in a, a cloth, and then you put them in a container called an osteophagus, or an ossuary. Uh, so, and well, I think, uh, I understand archaeologically they could not figure this out for the longest time because they have these basically small boxes full of bones, but it was part of this custom of you put them in the tomb, you then take them out a couple years later, put them inside of this osteophagy, and then you uh, store them and that's it, and make these nice ornate boxes. Um, kind of like a, an urn, I guess, but for bones, not for ashes. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, to give you an idea of what inside these, these, these areas right here, um, and I, just, I want to give you a snapshot of, of Jewish culture. Um, is there was, and there's always orations. So whenever somebody dies, people are always speaking something uh, over over the dead people. Um, now, forget specifically. It changes depending on I mean who you are in different cultures, what's spoken over you, especially when you look at like you know Greek Orthodox culture. But um, the Psalms, Isaiah, Proverbs, uh, anything from you know those that type of writing is is in here. Um, and the belief, of course, of Jews, I think, that you probably aware this, is that there is a persistence of the soul. So, um, just from Psalm uh, 112, 6, Surely the gifts shall not be moved forever. Uh, the righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. Um, Proverbs 10, 7, The memory of the just is blessed, but the name of the wicked shall rot. Uh, Isaiah 11, 10, uh, And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, uh, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, and to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. Uh, and there's there's a couple more, and these are specifically what was you know, I mean this is the the idea of, of Jewish custom over these over these bodies, uh, and that is it for the archetypical. Um, I'm going to jump into the ancient, and oh, actually go to the next slide. There's just um, this here is this is the family room I was talking about. This is um, uh, this is Herod's tomb, and I think it's Herod the Great. So that would have been the the Herod who was responsible for all the architecture um, was the king uh, three AD at the time of uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, but uh, it, this is definitely between Herod. I'm not sure if it's that Herod. Um, but anyway, you can yeah, go on to the next slide. Um, uh, the ancient. So, yeah, so <laughs> burial customs. Um, this is a dolmen, if I'm. Dolmen, yes. Uh, this is basically. I wanted to do a timeline, but I, I didn't have time. Uh, this is the, I think, 4510 BC. Uh, what would happen is they create these structures out of rock. Um, and it's, I mean, it's basically a tomb, and they covered this with earth. So the only way that we see these in this form right here is because you know thousands of years has removed the earth from these structures, but you'd never see them like this in in, in prehistory. Um, yep, yeah, heaps of tombs, um, frame. Yep, yeah. uh, urns. The idea of urns, burial urns, uh, came about in prehistory as well. Um, and that's about all I'm going to say in prehistory. I see we go to the next slide. Which Oh, uh, prehistory? That, um, prehistory? I don't know, like, <laughs> Middle East uh, prehistory? Mm -hmm. uh, Egypt, yes. Um, I don't want to say too much about Egypt because I think everybody 
knows a little bit about Egypt. Uh, right here, these are, I'm supposed to write that down. <laughs> what did I call this? That's Shakti, yeah, this is Shakti. This is, um, yeah, I mean, everybody knows about um, pyramids and yada yada, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I think the important thing about Egypt that I thought was really interesting is that in their burial chambers, they had a door, a fake door that they would put in burial chambers that was essentially a passageway into the eternal. And the only person who passed through that was the dead. So again, that idea of persistence, uh, um, and often what you find is you have, um, pretty sure this is Egyptian, um, it, where you'd have um, multi-chambered um, burial tombs. So what that means is you have um, basically, you know, so someone's buried here, and then you have um, an effigy of them here, and then you have a, a communal area right here. So the people will come and visit the communal area, and they say burn incense, and then the incense would flow into this area where the effigy is, so the effigy could smell it, and you know, because it's a representation of the, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know. Um, but but it's really interesting that, they, again, the, the funeral structure, like the burial uh, architecture, is um, it, it's it's based on that idea of, of the eternal, uh, that commune, like, I mean, for example, you shop these right here, um, had different different functions depending on what your class was within Egyptian society. Uh, I'm pretty sure that these are for like a for a ruling class. These ones right here. But what you find out that was absolutely fascinating was in the working class. So in sort of the, the middle class, lower class, what they do is they actually believe that when they went into the afterlife, they have to perform similar tasks to what they performed in their current life. So what they do is they create shakti that would perform their tasks for them. So in a lot of these, you know, less ostentatious burial. Uh, tombs, you find you know shakti with plows, shakti with I don't know, horse, whatever you do in whatever your vocation would be in ancient Egypt. So yeah, I mean I just, that idea of creating elements for use as 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 amazing. Because I always think of Egyptian culture, of course, of like the elaborate, you know, the gold and the whatever. But also on that the other scale of things, you have the idea of the you know going to work after you're dead. I thought that was pretty cool. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, Greece. Um, yeah, but Greece is pretty important just uh, when you start looking at sort of a progression of funerary ideas to see how they move from you know, the beginning to the end and, and, and where we are now and, and what sort of happened in the middle. So for a timeline, Greece is pretty important. Um, one of the cousins I thought was pretty interesting about, about Greece, and again, it has to do with a similar to the Egyptian tradition, and you'll see it repeated later, is um, they had to pay a coin to Charon. Charon? Don't know how you say that. Um, which is sort of the ferryman to Hades. So in order to get to Hades, you have to, to, to pay to get there. Um, and you see a lot of uh, Grecian um, tombs, burial plots, grave sites have that, um, that coin. Now, what are these? Uh, these are, um, this is a Larnix, and this is a Lotrophorus. Um, a Larnix is a small coffin or hatch chest, usually decorated with terracotta, and you find these in burial plots. Um, what's pretty interesting, though, is that you would also find these, which is a it's two-handled. Um, this was probably not representative of a burial uh, lush row for us, but I had a lot of trouble finding an appropriate picture for this, but that gives you a general idea of what it is. But these were associated with weddings, so you'd find these at weddings. So if you're unmarried in Grecian culture, they would bury you with one of these to tease you that you weren't married, I don't know, to sort of, you know, I, who you know, yeah, to hope that in the afterlife you, you find some. I, I'm not. I'm not sure, but that that was the. But but they remembered that in in, in death. So that's you find that there. Um, now, mausoleum. The term mausoleum comes from a Greek guy. That's kind of interesting. Some guy decided to build a really big tomb. Um, and Mausoleus, the guy that built this big tomb, uh, was listed as one seven wonders of the world. We don't know exactly what it looks like, so I don't have a picture of it. But when you think of the hanging gardens, the pyramids. Tomb of Mausoleus is one of the wonders of the world that don't know what it looks like. Um, and I'll get you to go to the next slide. Um, probably my favorite, well, not really, but I like it, is the Etruscans. Um, and the Etruscans is a culture that was taken over by the Romans um, when? Yeah, the Etruscans were 900 BC to 300 BC. Um, so they were sort of around the time of the Greeks, slightly after. Um, and I mean, Rome was founded in 750 BC and then went to, let's say, 313 AD once it became um, a Christian state, essentially. Like, um, the Etruscans, yeah, they were sort of absorbed by, by the Romans. And you'll find in the next slide with the Romans that um, a lot of the culture comes from the Etruscans or the Greek, because that's sort of the roots of their society. Um, but you find a lot of Etruscan, um, you have this sort of this, this 
this carving here, this is called the sarcophagus of the spouses, but you'll find in Etruscans that they have these sarcophagus, um, which is interesting because this means, uh, what do you call it, in, in, in turning in humine? I, I, but basically they're not cremated, is something to, to point out here, because later Roman burial, you would get some of mixed. Um, but yeah, I, I just thought the artwork on this was fabulous, not something to see every day where you have these carved reliefs. And oh, sorry, the other thing that is interesting about Etruscan culture is that originally, early in Etruscan culture, so we're talking sort of about like 450 BC, you'd have, I guess, a pretty pleasant motif. This is pretty nice. Um, but once you move into, um, or sorry, going backwards, 700 BC, you'd have pretty nice motifs. And then once you move into about um, five, so the seventh or sixth, so sixth and fifth century BC, so that's like 500 400 BC, Th this, these motifs went from nice to bad. So you start having gruesome scenes where you have battle, you have death, you have demons, um, psycho, um, uh, psychopomps, which is sort of like uh, funerary figures of a religious significance that are meant to usher the dead into different you know states. So um, like, for example, having, this is a Etruscan, but if, say if you're a Greek, if you had say, I, I can't think of it, Athena or I don't know, some Greek god or something, it was painted on your funerary art. It was meant to sort of to help ferry the, you know, create that sort of conduit for the dead. And that's 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 what you started started to see sort of later in the Etruscan culture, but not not in this stage right here. Um, yeah, and then they had sort of weird weird um, yeah sort of demon gut things that you start seeing on the um, they can do some research on. Um, and I'll get you to the next one on ancient Rome. Uh, yeah, this is what I was talking about the um, dovecotes or the columbarium where what we have is uh, Roman society, at least initially any, anyway, was almost exclusively cremation. Uh, so you have these type of things that we see, it's sort of like dove, you know, this is how they used to raise doves as well. They have these small little, it's like a chicken farm, I guess, or a battery, where you raise your, your pigeons, but now they're putting cremated uh, urns into them. Um, yep. But yeah, and then keep in mind that most of Roman culture comes from from the Etruscans or from uh, from Greece, uh, yeah, inhumation. That's what it's for. Um, but what's also interesting is in Roman culture, what they did is they started placing their burial um, monuments next to the roads. For it has to do with a lot of like um, uh, you have your elders or your ancestors, and you want your family line to be prominent in the you know to come for say political reasons or status reasons. So what you do is you end up building monuments on the side of the road, and that's something that you see as being extremely popular as well. Uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, this is just examples of Roman sort of roadside tombs, if you will, um, where you have these extremely elaborate, extremely architecturally beautiful tombs that were, I mean, it's kind of like pyramids where you, you're setting this up so that you can have, um, people can notice that you're dead. <laughs> um, and I'll give you the next slide as well. Um, and this is, this is slightly after, um, I mean, obviously initially cremation was the, you know, that's the way you get buried, but now you have inhumation where people are being buried alive. Um, but I, I, this is off the cuff, I also was kind of interesting how the Roman culture appeared to sort of just copy the burial practices of other, other cultures. Um, this is not Roman origin, the idea of inhumation. I mean, you can easily see that coming from the Etruscan culture, cremation, yeah, I mean, uh, it just kind of moves back and forth, and well, not back and forth, but it's 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 quite transient. And I thought that was kind of interesting about Roman culture was the fact that they didn't have any sort of definitive burial belief. It seemed to have been originated from cultures that they'd absorbed or been involved with and stuff like that. Um, one of the things, if you've seen the movie Gladiator, um, he's carrying around those little uh, portraits of his kid, uh, like his family, but you know, after they die, he's carrying around like wrapping up in cloth. Um, that's ancestor portraits because ancestor worship, pretty big deal. Um, and what happened is you'd have wax masks at the time of death in Rome, uh, and then you keep those at home, so you have this basically this funerary mask of the deceased at your home. Yeah, that's interesting as well. Um, and a, a lot of that idea of like remembering your dead because you, you, you sort of hang effigy of them in the temples and uh, the side of roads, like what these are right here. Not these type of roads, but you know, like ancient roads. Um, and I'll get you to the next slide. Um, and it takes us out of the Western world um, into China. Um, pretty interesting. Um, this is a jade burial suit, so it's made completely of jade. It was, it was thought to be mythical. Uh, it was recorded a lot in history, but 
it's not something that was found until just recently, and I think they found a couple of them now. But um, yeah, it's completely made a chain thing, covering that in. This is a Terracotta Warrior. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, the idea is, uh, I can show the next slide as well, um, is that, uh, sorry about the resolution, but um, this is for the first Emperor of the Qing Dynasty yeah, in 210 BC. Uh, what they do is, um, the idea of this is that they have, it's basically a palace underground, I guess, where you have all these soldiers and it's all directed towards a pathway towards uh, a spirit road, which could be miles long, where you see the idea of going into the, to the afterlife, into the next life. Um, underground palace, spirit road. Um, yep, yeah, that's kind of all I want to say on uh, Chinese. Uh, culture. I'm obviously skipping sort of the, 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 I mean, this is quite honorific. It doesn't sort of represent, you know, average ancient Chinese burial. Um, but, uh, yeah, I'm good with one. Uh, so, I will get you to go to Japan. No, yes, Japan, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, I have Japan twice in here, so that's why, because I think it's absolutely fascinating. But looking at ancient Japanese, you have something called the Kofun period, uh, which is the third to sixth century, um, which is this is what this shape is right here. I don't know if you can see this, but it's key. And this is like an island in the middle of a city. And none of these have been excavated, so we don't know what's actually in, in there. So we can't see a lot about the history of these periods because uh, the Japanese government said, you know, we're going to leave that the way it is, which makes a bit of sense um, when you think about you know, Chinese excavation, because um, they want to just preserve it. And so we don't know what it is, but that's called the Kofu, and that's that shape. And that, that's actually that's the designation for a period of time within Japanese history um, before, before Buddhism, I guess. Uh, when you have people, you know, people were buried this way. Uh, over here, you have a. I thought I read the name on this, but this is this is like the shakti. This is exactly like the shakti in Egyptian culture, where you have um, you know possessions for your possessions. Some of these are extremely beautiful. If you have time, and I cannot give you the name because I did not write it down. Um, but these 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 Japanese funeral objects, um, they always have sort of these these empty holes for eyes uh, and mouths and for the mouth. But if you, can, if you get a chance to look at those on like uh, Google or something like that, they are just they're beautiful. They're, they're pretty sweet. They're scary, but they're pretty awesome. Uh, and I just go to the next slide. Oh, you skipped it. <laughs> yeah. Um, historical Christianity. I just thought it was cool. Um, the only thing I'm gonna say about historical Christianity is that um, one of the bizarre things about historical Christianity is a lot of the um, ancient cathedrals were built on tombs of martyrs or people that were, you know, of interest to the historical. Christian church, um, so the supposed remains of an apostle or something like that. Um, and this was kind of the only religious culture, well, it, it's bizarre that this culture would then build um, a church on top of a, um, a, a basically a funeral plot. Um, because, I mean, it, it's pretty defiling in a, in a certain sense to be built. I mean, you'd never have that in Judaism, which is the roots of Christianity, and you would never have that in Islam. Um, so it's really interesting that you have uh, a lot of churches in the Western world, um, Christian churches in the Western world, where you have dead people inside of churches. And this is what they call a wall tomb, where you have people either buried in the wall um, or uh, sort of a wall monument to them, uh, where they might be buried. Uh, St. Peter's in Rome, it's got one of, uh, it's, 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 it doesn't have a wall tomb as far as I know, but it does have, it's built on a, on a gravesite, Christian gravesite. Um, until a plague, of course, once a plague came along, that's probably not a good idea. Um, yep, okay, cool, and yep, you can go on to the next slide. Um, yeah, uh, all I'll say about, I guess, Islam, historical Islamic um, tomb architecture is that you, these architectures here are, they're architectural, and that was sort of the expression of uh, Islamic um, death, I guess, essentially, in, in funeral uh, processions. Because you can't you can't do motifs of animals and people, so you, you you can either write scripts or you can do things architecturally, which is where you get some phenomenal um, Islamic architecture based around tombs, like the Taj Mahal. Um, this is not at the best angle, but Humayun's tomb, uh, Semenid Mausoleum. I'll show the next slide. Uh, yep, and this is actually Ayatollah well, Khomeini's tomb. Uh, it's still under construction, but what they do in a lot of these is they'll actually add things to them. So this is a tomb, but they'll add a hospital to it, or this is a tomb, and they'll add a meeting place to it. So it's kind of interesting that you have tombs in sort of used space. Uh, and I'll get you to go to the next slide. Oh yeah, current, this is where it gets interesting. You have the background, you know everything about what happened in the past, and that's time to get sort of into the present. And then I'm going to get you into some discussion questions and as you can people. 
So, next slide. Yeah, Eastern Orthodox. I love this because my grandma is Eastern Orthodox. So, I think this is, I guess, pretty fascinating because I know all this weird stuff about Eastern Orthodox. Um, you, you notice that it's open casket, um, laid in state. Uh, so, I mean, this is obviously a viewing. I've got people uh, looking uh, over what's going on. Um, and there's also a bizarre custom here is they do, they do this also in Catholicism is uh, ablution, where they'll pray over the, to remove the sins of the dead, uh, sort of post-mortem. Um, although in Eastern Orthodox culture, the idea behind that is not so much to remove the sins of the dead as it is to sort of, you know, clean the slate, I guess. Um, you just to make sure everything's right with God. <laughs> so as opposed to sort of, you know, past transgressions and whatnot. Um, so yeah, there's, um, you find a lot of cultures, as soon as somebody dies, you wash them. It's the exact same in uh, Eastern Orthodox. Um, it's, it's, if it's a priest, which this guy is, he'll have a, a, a gospel underneath there. Um, sometimes these guys aren't placed in coffins, they'll be, they'll be seating, and then they'll be placed in the burial chamber like that. I had a picture of it, but it looked kind of creepy, so I didn't, I didn't check it up there. Um, yeah, so, and the actual ceremony up here. Um, they, they, there's a lot of representational things in a lot of modern ceremonies, for example, wheat. Um, is, is extremely ceremonial. I remember this as a kid, at, at pretty much every religious observance that you have, whether it was Easter or Christmas, you have some sort of wheat dish there. Um, and that's no different than at funerals you can have. You have wheat at um, uh, funerals. It's symbolic of the grain which falling to the ground dies and brings forth much fruit. So the idea is that this person's died and brings forth fruit. And that's the idea of having a grain at a, at a funeral and at Easter. Um, yeah, and you have to kiss this guy eventually. That's important as well. Um, and the interesting thing is, it's, the Eastern Orthodox um, service is kind of antithetical to itself because one of the noted, um, I'm sorry to say, biblical um, sort of mandate or idea is that, um, uh, yeah, like Thessalonians 4:13 talks about even as others which have no hope. So this is obviously a lamentable occasion, but the idea behind it, Christian burial being this, well, they're in a better place, so it's not really that big a deal. Um, and so it's kind of this this interesting juxtaposition between lament and, you know, hey, that's fine, he's dead. Um, and I'll get you to go to the next slide. Um, I am, this is just another uh, Eastern Orthodox color that's great right on this one, but you see, again, he's, yeah, this is Hinduism. Yeah, anyway, that's, <laughs> you see it's, it's quite, um, yeah, I just, the color's great, and, but you'll always have these open tombs, that's something that's quite, Distinct of Ethan Orthodox, so you might not get another. Is his face covered? Or? Uh, yeah, yeah, his face is covered. Um, that would differ depending on, you know, who's, yeah, what's it's different tradition. And again, it, this is probably a priest. I'm assuming by the amount of people around him and the fact that he has all these crosses. If he was like, you know, a lay person or like a, like just a regular guy, like not part of the, you know, a priest class. Or if he was trained to be a priest, you'd have completely different governments depending on, you know, who you know, you know what's happening. Uh, next slide. Yeah, the, uh, Hinduism. The, the biggest, um, you know, the thing with Hinduism is there's not a lot of art, artifacts. I'm sorry about the picture. This was like, I mean, it's cremation, so I'm going to discuss it in a lot of other things as well. But um, the, the thing about Hinduism is everything is burnt, so there's not a lot of um, funerary artifacts about Hinduism. So there's not a lot of ancient history, um, as far as funeral artifacts go, about Hinduism. Um, Antiesti is what the Hindu funeral rite is called, and I'm not going to talk about uh, Sikh culture as well, because I, I found that a lot of the traditions were similar. Uh, a lot of inconsistency in theory practice, it could, you know, it, but it's because different sort of types of Hinduism, uh, as far as I understand, and cremation. You always cremate, there's no such thing as, as burial. Um, and of course, I think you can understand that because the Hindu concept of detachment of soul from the body at the time of death and the transmigration of the soul from one body to another, uh, reincarnation. Um, so, yeah. Cremation, um, the dead is considered to be a, a symbol of great impurities, so you don't touch this guy once he dies. Um, there's lots of, I mean, depending on, they'll, they'll put different colors on the dead body, depending on, you know, was it a male, was it a female, was he married, was he not. Um, the chief mourner, which is usually the eldest son, is responsible for lighting this fire. So if your dad dies and you're Hindu, you have to, it's your job to, well, if you're the, if you're the eldest male, you have to, you have to light him on fire. Um, and they, 13 days of mourning, so they, they recognize, uh, yeah, 13, 13 days of mourning. And then what happens is, is part of the idea behind the, the, that, the, the funeral services, that the ashes of whoever's burnt, um, 
they get taken and they get put into a river. Um, I could, I could guess what the symbol, symbolism of that is, but I, I couldn't find any specific detail on, on white. I'm sure you could if you want to look into that. But as part of the whole, you know, reincarnation, that person has to go back into the river. And if you're rich, you send them to one of the good, the, you know, the property of the the Varanasi, the hard water, but you know, whatever, some some fancy rivers. Um, and oh, this is this is cool. If you have a funeral for somebody who is alive, okay, so you think they're dead, and like they're just you know went to the store or something, and they come back, you have to have an anti-funeral for that person. Okay, so if they're walking back, they're like, we totally thought you were dead, man, and they're like, sorry. And before this, it's it's a mandate. I think it was to 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 I don't know de-funeral that guy. So, so I thought that was like a real fucking fire or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Do you unhurt somebody? <laughs> I was like, sorry about that, we'll put you back together. <laughs> so, um, put the back between our members and next slide. Um, yeah, uh, Islam. Um, pretty simple, um, sort of, yeah, I mean, it's. Uh, somebody dies, I'm just going to go through the procession of what happens here. Um, you bathe the body. Um, after you bathe the body, you. Um, you enshroud them, so you, this person in shroud, you see they've been wrapped in something. Uh, you'll then play the, pray the funeral prayer, uh, which I couldn't find a copy of that, otherwise. Um, and then you bury this person. Um, similar burial traditions to Judaism as far as when you place them in the grave, they have to be certain, you know, they can't be close to each other and whatnot. Um, women, you notice that there's no women in there. Um, they're discouraged because they are considered hysterical. So, no women in there. Um, and also, when they, when these, when, if in Islam, when you're buried, um, I don't quite understand the significance of this, but they'll actually take hand-packed soil and put them under your body. So to, to for your head and for your shoulder, they'll put them uh, under there, sort of prop you up before they, they bury it. Um, and can you go to the next slide? Yeah, uh, that's Buddhism. But go back again, sorry. Well, um, but reasonably you know, straightforward, usually this ceremony ends with everybody getting wrapped, depending on what region you're from, uh, and they'll pack soil on top of the person. So. It's, it's more of a mound than it is an underground. So um, some, not all, uh, Islamic cemeteries have um, it's sort of raised, not in the ground, um, and they don't they don't um, usually have very ornate gravestones. But that's sort of a change of it. Uh, and I'll just go to Buddhism. Um, Buddhism, very interesting. Um, not Japanese. I'm going to get to that in a second. I think that's that's really quite honestly uh, to me that comes across as a separate burial culture. Um, but the, you have this is called. Soko Shun Butsu. Let's say that together, everybody. Um, and this is what that is: is that self mummification. Uh, so what happens is, in the Buddhist, if you're Buddhist monk, you say, "Okay, I'm gonna go mummify myself," um, and you start, you start you know, fasting, you start, you know, excreting. You, you basically, you know, you, you clear out your body. You decided to die. You start in consuming poison, and eventually, what happens is your followers will put you in a box. And you're still alive, and you sort of meditate yourself to death. Um, and obviously, there's a, there's a lot of processes about um, um, you know getting rid of like bodily fluids and things like that, which is fasting and you know type of diet you have before you go into into the self location. Um, and what what you have is in, in Buddhist culture is um, the, the followers continue on to maintain these 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 bodies. So I mean, this has obviously been taken care of um, to some extent. And you find there are even have cases where these have been gilded in gold, and then they've been made to look pretty, like you know, you have descriptions and whatnot on them. And that's 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 funeral culture. The idea of the lotus position is, is extremely important as well. So it's a I understand a meditative practice. Um, and another one that I did not put a picture of. You see, there's a blank space. Where my drill is. I did not put a picture of the sky burial because that was pretty nasty. But in Tibetan Buddhism, um, you have where people are cut. Because you know woods, you can't cremate anybody. Um, they're cut so that you know the flesh is exposed. Okay, yeah. and you, you, at that point you have to, yeah, the birds basically take them away, and um, it's it's lots of fun. So, but I don't want to have a picture of that because it was just a bunch of birds hitting a corpse. Um, now I just go to the next slide. Okay, the yeah, Momo. Um, yeah, this is sort of moving into modern culture. And I think I'm probably going to have to skip Japanese just to get a sign quickly. Um, Japanese is a fascinating culture, different things. But I'll get you to go to the next slide. Um, modern, oh, this is the Sagada. Uh, this takes place in southern China and the Philippines, or they do is they put the dead on the side of the mountains. The idea behind that is they want to get closer to God. Let's go to the next slide. 
Yep. Uh, West Africa, they bury people under the floorboards. I'll just go to the next slide. Couldn't have a picture of that. Um, Scar Schooners, I think, is absolutely fascinating. What they do is they bury the dead. Um, where is it? They bury the dead and they, um, as part of the funeral, yeah. Okay. The uh, Scottish Highlands, you bury the deceased with a wooden plate resting on his chest. In the plate were placed small amounts of earth and salt to represent the future of the deceased. The earth hinted that the body would decay and become one with the earth, while the salt represented the soul, which would not decay. And that's the salt, and I'll get you to the next slide. Um, yeah, Ghana. Everybody thinks this is pretty interesting. Boy, this is, this is kind of just a novelty, novelty period. It started in the 50s, uh, where what they have is they have, and this is just, there's heaps of these. There's Nokia phones, there's cars, there's everything. Uh, where often they'll represent, like, or even you have alcohol and cigarettes. If someone had a vice, like, you know, a negative vice, they can often be buried in, in, in you know, cigarettes and alcohol. Um, I don't know if that's just a poke fun of them or what, but, um, but I don't know, this, this would probably be, this guy's a cobbler, I imagine. I don't know the significance of that, that. <laughs> Get it, might have been a farmer. I don't know what the key would mean. Um, but, fascinating. Okay, next. <laughs> um, and this is, I, Okay, this is modern. This is modern culture. This is sporting. Um, something you're seeing a lot now is um, you have um, up in the top corner there. That's some uh, soccer team. But a lot of modern soccer clubs now, especially in their new buildings, are building basically columbarium, columbariums, or they're building funeral plots as part of the soccer pitch or next to the soccer pitch of the building, stadium, because you have fans that are so dedicated to their sport that they're that's now. I mean, they're identifying with it. Like these, are, this is this year is a rip. That's the logo of some team. I don't know which one. You see the soccer ball in the back there. There's heaps of images of that. Um, and I mean, in the UK, you can you can get a soccer funeral where you know you're identified with the funeral. Uh, you can't see this too well, but uh, this is a man who's um, he's died, and I guess he watched that TV. Um, and he's a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, and they, this is just an interesting form of viewing. So, sort of prior to the funeral, they put the body out so you can view him. Uh, and here he is watching his TV. So this is a dead guy. And you're coming to visit him, and he's sitting on his recliner, and that's, uh, I didn't see a picture of him right here. Uh, and I had a couple more of those, but uh, I just thought it was a fascinating way to sort of interact with the dead. Um, I'll just go to the next slide. Uh, this here, this is also, this is, um, this guy's dead. Um, and this is, he was 22, he was shot um, a whole bunch of times, and this is in Colombia or somewhere in, in South America or Central America. And this is how they decided to do it. And the, the funeral company that does this does a whole bunch of things like this. This is just one that they did. But this is how people came to see it in this funeral. It was like this. Um, and it's, it's quite macabre. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide. And um, again, this here, this is a gentleman who was um, uh, shot. I think he's a music producer. Um, he's in his Lamborghini. I thought that was a terrifying picture. Um, this is Space Burials. Um, Timothy Leary, Gene Roddenberry. Um, they were both buried in space. This is just a picture of the satellite. I don't think that I think it was Space Burial. But uh, the idea of taking your ashes or a portion of them. There's only about 250 people on the planet who've done it, but you can do that if you want. Uh, and you're seeing this a lot in American and um, sort of Western uh, European culture is the idea of um, these celebrating brands, celebrating music. You can get a kiss, uh, you know, Gene Simmons' kiss. Um, you can get heaps of different um, coffins to celebrate, I guess, kind of like Donna. Um, you know, different. This guy built that himself, by the way. Uh, different um, yeah, coffins. I want to show the next slide. Yeah. Okay. Oops. This is one I've read about Japanese culture. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to do this extremely quickly. Um, yep. You have to give them three thousand yen or thirty thousand yen. That's just a tradition. Let me show the next slide. Um, yeah. And the interesting thing about that is um, cremation. Ninety-nine point eight one percent of Japanese are cremated. These are the bones that are left over after cremation. It's a ceremony. Um, post cremation, what you do is you take the bones, and so this is like family and friends. You take the bones, you take your chopsticks, and you you you. And this is the only time in Japanese culture, by the way, it is not a social faux pas to pass things in your chopsticks or to grab something in someone else's chopsticks. Just so you know. Um, but what you do is you put them into the urn, and you have to do it in a specific order because you have to start with the feet and then with the head, or specifically the collarbone. But um, the otherwise, the person picked upside down in the urn. So, uh, and of course, you can't get land in, um, in Japan, so people are cremated, but they still have um, these uh, grave plots um, where this is kind of, you have the name of the person on the, the grave marker right here, and they'll have their ashes, I'm not sure exactly where they put them in here, but this is sort of their, their burial plot, because and you, the whole family will end up there eventually through generations, I guess, uh, because you can't, land's just too expensive, and it 
Buddhist culture, of course, is um, is to cremate them. Um, so this will be the name. But every time that they have a funeral service, and they have quite a lot of these remembrances, you see they have these wooden sticks right here. What they do is they bring these to commemorate the services. And the reason I point that out is just so that you know that in Japanese culture, it is important to, to return to the grave and sort of commemorate uh, commemorate the dead. Um, also, in recent times, all ashes have been getting stolen. So famous people, if they get buried in one of these, put some of them ashes. So just keep that in mind. Um, but Ellen, the last point I just want to make about, um, oh, by the way, this is called Suaga, which is that right there. Um, the last point I want to make is that uh, Japan is a Shinto and a Buddhist culture, but 90% of all funeral practices are Buddhist, um, which I thought, I mean, that'd be like having a Muslim and Christian society and everyone had Muslim railways. So I thought that was quite, quite fascinating. And I'll get you to the next slide, which I think is the last one. Yeah, the end. Um, this is uh, Thomas Lynch, and I was reading about modern North American burials. Um, and this guy, he did a documentary for the um, PBS called uh, The Undertaker. He's an undertaker. Uh, him and his son and the rest of his family own a, they own like five or six uh, funerary homes and parlors, and this guy's the boss. Uh, and he was talking about funeral practices within the United States, within you know, modern America in the last 50 years. And the comment that he made was um, the, the biggest difference in, 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 in modern culture and the way that you know, we, our generation, sort of interacts with the dead. And first of all, he's making the point that there is a difference with the way that we interact with the dead, is that we don't interact with the dead. Uh, our funeral processions at this point, it's only in this generation where we can have a funeral procession or we can go to a funeral and the deceased is not even there. So there's cases where that body is somewhere else. It's off being cremated, it's off doing something. Or we're having celebration services, which is kind of the antithesis of what you had through a lot of ancient history. And um, one of the interesting things that, that he pointed out, because basically we looked at the, 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 the strata of, of um, structured burial services. And the point that he's made is in the last 50 years, especially within North America, is that as um, structured religious practices around burial begins to deteriorate, what he's finding is that um, people who have structured religious practices around burial have mechanisms in place to deal with the, I guess, the loss and the tragedy and trauma associated with, you know, the event of death. Whereas, because there's no sort of, you know, modern mechanism that, that a lot of people agree on, um, he's saying that undertakers now are becoming essentially the, the clergy of death. Um, and he, his, his, I guess, observation was that those people that, that don't have, you know, even if it, you know, whether it's, whether it's like Catholic or Islamic or whatever the case is, just having those strictures, people without those type of things find that they have almost panic responses to, you know, the death process. And that's his observation as, as an undertaker, uh, which I thought was, was quite interesting. And uh, he went on to talk about, uh, one of the things that he mentioned was just that, yeah, the, the deterioration of, of of burial culture within 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 our culture, I guess, and our, our idea of, of we don't interact with death anymore. It's something we look beyond. It's not something we're concerned about. So we can easily go our whole lives without never having gone to a funeral or going to a funeral that's kind of doesn't acknowledge the fact that somebody's dead. Um, and if you get a chance, look, check out the PBS website for that. It's called The Undertaking. Um, it's pretty fascinating. His son, who's 27, does the same thing he does. It is fascinating. And that's it. That's everything I have to say on that. Uh, is there any time for questions or have I used it like all the time? Um, oh, it's about five minutes to now. Oh. So it was a very nice, long and extensive so, presentation. I to do like half an hour. There's a lot of info. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah.